Has anyone in here ever worked with libUSB or PyUSB? Hands up. Okay. Who also thinks USB is a pain? <laughs> okay. Sergey and Alexander were here back in at the 2063, that's a long time ago, I think it was back in Berlin. And back then they presented their first homemade, or not homemade, SDR, Software Defined Radio. This year they are back again and they want to show us how they implemented another one using an FPGA and to communicate with it they used PCI Express. So I think if you thought USB was a pain, let's see what they can tell us about PCI Express. A warm round of applause for Alexander and Sergey for building a high throughput, low latency, PCIe based software defined radio. Hi everyone, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the first day of the Congress. So, um, just a little bit background about um, what we've done previously and why we are um, doing uh, what we are doing right now is that uh, we started um, working with software defined radios. And by the way, who knows what software defined radio is? Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, and whoever actually use the software defined radio is RTL SDR or okay less people but, but still quite a lot okay good um, I wonder uh, whether anyone here uses more expensive radios like usurps less people but few okay good cool so um, before 2008 I have no had no idea what software defined radio is was working with voice over IP software person, et cetera, et cetera. So I, in, in 2008, I uh, heard about OpenBTS, got introduced to software defined radio, and I wanted to like, make it really work. And that's what led us to, uh, to, 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 to today. Um, in 2009, um, we had to develop a clock tamer, uh, a hardware, which uh, allows to use allowed to use uh, user of one uh, to run GSM without problems. If anyone ever tried doing this without uh, a good clock source, knows what I'm talking about. And we presented uh, this. It wasn't really an SDR; it was just a clock source. We presented this uh, in 2009 in uh, uh, in. Um, uh, 2063, then uh, we realized that using USERP1 is not really um, a good idea because we wanted to build a robust industrial grade base stations. So we started developing our own software defined radio, um, which we call Umtrix. And um, it was in 2000, we started, started this in 2011. Um, our first base stations with it were. Just, were deployed in 2013, but um, I always wanted to have something really small and really inexpensive. And back then, it wasn't possible. My original idea in 2011 uh, were to build a, a, a PCI Express card. Uh, mini, uh, sorry, uh, mini not PCI Express PCI card, PCI. but mini PCI card. If you remember, uh, there were like all the Wi-Fi cards in uh, mini PCI form factor, and I thought that, that would be really cool to have an SDR in mini PCI, so I can plug this into my laptop or in some embedded uh, PC and have a nice uh, SDR equipment. But back then, it just was not like really possible because electronics were bigger, and more uh, power hungry and just didn't work that way. So we, we designed Umtrix to um, work over gigabit Ethernet and it was about that size. So um, now uh, we spent this year designing something which really brings me to what I wanted those years ago. So um, the, the Xtrix is a mini PCI Express. Again, there was no PCI Express back then, so <laughs> now it's mini PCI Express, which is even smaller than PCI, mini, uh, mini PCI. Um, and 
it's built to be embedded friendly, so you can uh, plug this into um, a single board computer, embedded single board computer. If you have a laptop with a mini PCI Express, you can plug this into your laptop, and you have a really small uh, software-defined radio equipment. And we really want to uh, make it inexpensive. That's why I was asking how many of you have ever worked with RTL SDR, how many of you ever worked with USERPs, because the gap between them is pretty big. Uh, and we want to really bring uh, the software-defined radio to masses. Definitely won't be as cheap as RTL SDR, but we try to make it as close as possible. And at the same time, so at the size of RTL SDR, at the price, well, higher, but hopefully, hopefully it will be affordable to pretty much everyone. Um, we really want to bring high performance um, into your hands. And by high performance, I mean this is a full transmit receive with two channels transmit, two channels receive, uh, two by, which is usually called two by two MIMO in the, in the radio world. Um, it, uh, the goal was to uh, bring it to 160 mega samples per second, uh, which can roughly give you like 120 megahertz of radio spectrum available. Um, so what we were able to achieve is, um, again, yeah, this is mini PCI Express form factor. Um, it has small um, Arctic 7, that's uh, the smallest and most inexpensive uh, FPGA which has ability to work with a PCI Express. Uh, it has uh, LMS 7000 um, chip for uh, our FIC. Very high performance, very um, um, tightly um, what's called, said, uh, tightly embedded chip with even a DSP blocks inside. Uh, it has even a GPS chip here. You, do you see my? No, you can't see it. But um, so it has. Uh, you can actually on the right upper side you can see a GPS chip. So you can actually synchronize your SDR to GPS for perfect uh, clock stability. So you won't have any problems uh, running any telecommunication systems like GSM, 3G, 4G uh, due to clock problems. Um, and uh, it also has interface for SIM cards, so you can actually uh, create a software-defined radio modem and there are all the open source projects uh, to build one in a 4 um called the SRS UE, if you're interested, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, really tightly packed one. And if you put this into perspective, that's how it all started in 2006, and that's uh, what you have 10 years later. It's pretty impressive. So, <laughs> thanks. But I think it's actually applause to the whole industry who is working on shrinking the sizes because we just put stuff on the PCB. You know, we are <laughs> not building the silicon itself. Um, interesting thing is that we did the first approach. We said, let's pack everything. Let's uh, do a very um, tight PCB design. Uh, we did an eight layer PCB design. And when we send it to a fab to estimate the, the, the cost, it turned out it's 15,000 US dollars uh, per piece. Well, in small volumes, obviously, but still a little bit too much. So <laughs> we had to uh, redesign this. And the first, um, the first thing which we uh, did is uh, we still kept eight layers because in our experience, number of layers nowadays uh, have only minimal impact on the cost of the device. So like six, eight layers, the price difference is not so big. Um, but we um, did complete rerouting and only uh, kept uh, two deep micro wires and never used the buried wires. So this make it much easier and much faster for the fab to manufacture it. And the price suddenly went five, six times down. And in volume, again, it will be uh, significantly cheaper. And that's just for uh, geek porn. 
how, how PCB looks inside. <laughs> So now uh, let's, let's go into real stuff. So PCI Express, why did we choose PCI Express? Um, as it was said, USB is a pain in the ass. You can't really use uh, USB in industrial systems for a whole variety of reasons, it's just unstable. Um, so uh, we did use uh, Ethernet for many years uh, successfully, but Ethernet has one problem, uh, first of all, uh, Inexpensive for Ethernet is only one gigabit, and one gigabit does not offer you enough <coughs> bandwidth to carry all the data you want. Plus, it's power hungry, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, PCI Express is really a good choice because it's low power, it has low latency, uh, it, it has very high bandwidth, and it's available almost universally. We, uh, when we started looking into this, we realized that even ARM boards, some of ARM boards have PCI, mini PCI Express slots, which was a big surprise for me, for example. So the problems is that uh, unlike USB, you do need to write your own uh, kernel driver for this and there is no way around. And uh, it is really hard to write this driver universally, so we are writing it obviously for Linux because we are working with embedded systems, but if we want to rewrite it for Windows or for Mac OS, we'll have to do a lot of rewriting. So we focus on uh, what we want uh, on Linux only right now. And now the hardest part, debugging is really non-trivial. One small error, and your PC is completely hang because you did something wrong. And you have to reboot it and restart it. And that's like debugging kernel, but sometimes even harder. <laughs> so, um, and to make it worse, uh, there is no really easy to use plug and play interface. So if you want to restart normally when you, do, when you develop a PCI Express card, when you want, when you want to restart it, you have to restart your, 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 your um, development machine again. Not a nice way, it's really hard. So the first thing we did is uh, we found to, uh, that we can use Thunderbolt 3, which is just recently released, uh, and it has ability to uh, work directly with, um, um, with uh, PCI Express bus. So it basically has a mode in which it converts a PCI Express into plug and play interface. So if you have a laptop uh, which supports Thunderbolt 3, then uh, you can use this uh, to, to plug and play your plug or end plug uh, your, your device to make your development easier. Uh, there are always problems. There's no easy way. Uh, there is no documentation. Uh, Thunderbolt is not compatible with Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt 3 is not compatible with Thunderbolt 2. So uh, we had to um, buy a special laptop with Thunderbolt 3 with special cables, like all this, all this hard, uh, hard stuff. And if you really want to get documentation, you have to sign NDA and send a business plan to them so they can approve that your business makes sense. I mean. <laughs> Um, so we actually opted out. We said not to, to go through this. Uh, what we did is uh, we found that someone is actually making uh, PCI Express or Thunderbolt 3 converters and selling them as dev boards. And um, that was a big relief because it saved us lots of time, lots of money. Um, just ordered it uh, from, uh, from, some, from some Asian company. Um, and yeah, this is how it looks like, this converter. So you buy it, like with several pieces, you can plug in your PCI Express card there, and uh, you uh, plug this into your laptop. And this is uh, uh, this with the uh, exterior uh, already plugged into it. Now, the only problem we found is that um, typically, um, UEFI has a security control enabled, uh, so that uh, any random uh, Thunderbolt device can't uh, uh, hijack your, your PCI bus and can't get access to your kernel memory and do some bad stuff, which is a good idea. The only problem is that there is, uh, it's not fully implemented in Linux. 
So under Windows, if you plug in a device which, is, uh, which has no security features, which is not certified, then it will uh, politely ask you, like, do you really trust this device? Do you want to use it? You can say yes. Under Linux, it just does not work. <laughs> so uh, we spent some time trying to figure out how to get around this. There are some patches from Intel, which are not mainlined, and we were not able to actually get them work. So uh, we just had to disable uh, this security measure um, in, in the laptop. So be aware um, that this is the case. And uh, we suspect that uh, happy users of uh, Apple uh, might not be able to do this because Apple don't have BIOS, so you probably can't disable uh, this feature. So probably a good incentive for someone to actually finish writing the driver. Um, so now to the goal. So we wanted to we want to achieve 160 mega samples per second, two by two MIMO, which means to transceive, uh, to transmit, uh, to receive channels at uh, 12 bits, uh, which is uh, roughly 7.5 uh, gigabit per second. So first result when we plugged this when we got this board from the fab, it didn't work. I was expecting. Yeah, as expected. So the first uh, interesting thing we realized is that, uh, well, first of all, uh, the FPGA has uh, hardware uh, blocks for talking to a PCI Express, uh, which which called GTP, which basically implement like a PCI Express um, serial physical layer. But the thing is, um, the numbering is. Uh, reversed in the in PCI Express in, in, in FPGA, and we did not realize this. So we had to do very, very fine soldering to actually swap the, <laughs> swap the lanes. You can see this very fine um, work there. We also uh, found that one of the components was that bug, uh, which is a well-known um, term for chips uh, which uh, at design stage are placed uh, mirrored, so we mirrored, uh, occasionally mirrored uh, the, 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 the pinout, so we had to solder it uh, upside down. And if you can realize how small it is, you can also appreciate the work <laughs> done. Uh, and what, what's funny, when I was looking at uh, dead bugs, I actually found a manual from NASA which describes how to properly solder dead bugs uh, to get it approved. <laughs> so this is the link. I, I think you can go there and uh, um, enjoy. There's lots of fun stuff there. So uh, after fixing all of this, uh, our sex, uh, next attempt is kind of works. So uh, next stage is debugging the FPJ code, which has to talk to PCI Express, and PCI Express has to talk to Linux kernel. Linux kernel has to talk to the driver. Driver has to talk to the user space. So um, peripherals are easy. So all the UART, SPIs, we've got to work almost uh, immediately. Uh, no problems with that. But DMA was a real beast. So we spent lots of time trying to get uh, DMA uh, to work. And the problem is that with DMA, um, it's on an FPGA, so you can't just place a breakpoint like you do in C or C++ or any other languages. Um, it's real-time system running, um, not system, like it's uh, real-time um, hardware which is uh, running on, um, on the fabric. So. Uh, you, we had to, or Sergey, who was <laughs> mainly developing this, had to write a lot of small test benches and, and uh, test everything piece by piece. So all parts of the DMA code we had was wrapped into a small test bench, which was emul emulating all the, all the tricks. And as uh, classics predicted, it took about five to 10 times more than actually writing the code. So um, we really blew up our uh, predicted timelines by doing this, but in the end we've got really stable, stable work. So um, some suggestions for anyone who will try to repeat this exercise. 
is um, there is a logic analyzer built into Xilinx, uh, and you can use it. It's nice. It's uh, sometimes it's very helpful, but uh, you can't debug uh, transient bugs which are coming out at when some weird conditions are coming up. So. Um, you have to implement some readback registers, which shows important statistic, uh, like important data about how your system behaves. In our case, it's various counters on the uh, DMA interface, so you can actually see, uh, kind of see what's happening with your with your data. Is it received? Is it sent? How much is sent? How much is received? Um, so, like for example, we can see when we saturate the bus um, or when uh, actually there's an underrun, so the host is not providing data fast enough, so we can at least understand whether it's a host problem or whether it's an FPGA problem and which part should we debug next. Because again, it's a very multi-layer problem. You start with FPGA, PCI Express, kernel, driver, user space, and any part can fail. So you, you, you can't work <laughs> blind like this. So. Um, Again, the goal uh, was to get 160 mega samples. With the first naive implementation, we got two mega samples per second, roughly 60 times slower. Um, the the problem is that software just wasn't keeping up and wasn't sending data fast enough. So there was like many things done, but the most important parts is use real time priority if you want to get very stable results. And, well, fix software bugs. And uh, one of the most important bugs we had was that uh, DMA buffers were not freed uh, in proper time immediately. So they were busy for longer than they should be, which introduced extra cycles and basically just reduced the bandwidth. So um, at this point, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about how to implement a high-performance uh, driver for Linux because uh, if you want to get real real performance you have to start with the right design so there are basically three approaches uh, and the whole spectrum in between like two approaches and the whole spectrum in between which is, uh, which you can uh, refer to three so the first approach is a full uh, kernel control uh, in which case uh, kernel driver not only is um, doing the transfer, it actually has all the logics uh, of controlling your device and only export um, your QTL uh, to the user space. And that's the kind of a traditional way of writing drivers. Your, your user space is completely abstracted from all the details. Well, the problem is that this is probably the slowest way to do it. So. Um, the other way is uh, what's called the zero copy interface, where only control is held in the kernel and data is provided, raw data is provided to your space as is. So you avoid the memory copy, which make it faster, but still um, not. Uh, fast enough if you really want to achieve maximum performance because you still have um, uh, context switches between the kernel and the user space. So uh, the most, the fastest approach possible is to have full user space implementation when kernel just expose everything and says now you do it yourself and you have no uh, you have no context switches like almost no and uh, uh, you can really optimize everything so um, what is what are the problems with this um, now the pro, the pros I already mentioned no um, no switches between kernel and the user space it's very low latency because of this as well it's very high bandwidth but um, if you are not interested in getting the, the very high performance, the most performance, and you just want to have like some um, little, like say, low bandwidth performance, then um, you will have to add hacks because you can't get notification from the kernel that resource is available, which is more data available. So um, it also makes it vulnerable, vulnerable because if user space can access it, then it can do whatever it wants. So we, uh, at the end, uh, decided... Oh, so one more important thing. So how to actually to get 
uh, the, the best performance out of, uh, out of the bus. Um, and this is, we have to decide whether you want to pull your device or uh, not to pull or get notified. So what is polling? I guess everyone as a programmer understands it. So polling is when you ask repeatedly, uh, are you ready, are you ready, are you ready? And when it's ready, you get the data immediately. So it's basically a busy loop of your, you're just constantly asking device uh, what's happening. And um, you need to dedicate a full core, and thanks God we have multi-core CPUs nowadays, so you can dedicate the full core uh, to this polling uh, and you can just pull constantly. But again, uh, if you don't need this highest performance, you just need to get something, then you will be wasting a lot of CPU resources. Uh, so at the end, uh, we uh, decided to uh, do a combined architecture uh, where uh, it is possible to pull, but there's also a chance to get notification from a kernel to, uh, for, for applications which, require, which need low bandwidth, but also uh, require a better CPU uh, performance, which I think is the best way if you're uh, trying to target both worlds. So very quickly, so uh, the architecture uh, of um, uh, of the of the system. So we tried to make it very very um, portable, so uh, and flexible. So uh, there is a, a kernel driver. Um, there, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. There is a, there is. A, a kernel driver uh, which uh, talks to a low-level library which implements all this logic which we took out of the driver to, actually, to, to control the PCI Express, to work with DMA, uh, to um, provide all the, uh, all the to, to hide all the details of the actual bus implementation. And then uh, there is a high-level library which talks to uh, this low-level library and also to libraries which implement control of actual peripherals and most importantly uh, to the library which implements control over the, our um, RFIC chip. So this way um, it's very modular, we can replace PCI Express with something else later, um, we might be able to port it to other operating systems um, and that's, um, that's, that's the goal. Um, another interesting issue is when you start writing a Linux kernel driver, you very quickly realize that while uh, LDD, which is a classical um, classic book for uh, Linux driver writing, is good and it will give you a good insight, it's not actually up to date. It's, uh, well, like more than uh, 10 years old. And there's a lot of uh, new interfaces which are not described there, so you have to resort to, to reading um, the manuals and all the documentation in the kernel itself. Well, at least you get the up-to-date information. So um, the decisions we made is to, is to make everything easy. So we use a TTI, a TTY for GPS, and so you can really attach a pretty much any uh, application which talks to a GPS. Um, like sort of all of existing applications can just uh, work out of the box. And uh, uh, we also wanted to be able to synchronize uh, system clock to GPS. Uh, so we get like automatic log synchronization across multiple systems, which is very important when we are deploying multiple, many, many devices around the world. So uh, we uh, plan to do uh, two interfaces. One is um, uh, key PPS, and another is a DCD, because a D DCD line on the UART exposed over TTY. So because there are, again, we found that there are two types of applications, one that support one API and others that support other API, and there is no um, common thing, so we have to support both. Um, what's interesting else is that, yeah, and the, as we described, um, we uh, want to have pools so we can get notifications from the kernel uh, when uh, data is uh, available and uh, we don't need to do um, real uh, busy looping all the time. So after all the software optimizations, we've got to like 10 mega samples per second. Still very, very far from uh, what we want to achieve. 
Um, now there should have been a lot of explanations about PCI Express, but when we actually wrote everything we wanted to say, we realized it's just like a full, full two hours talk just on PCI Express. So um, <laughs> we are not going to give it here. I'll just give some highlights which are most interesting. Um, if, you, if there is real interest, uh, we can set up a workshop at some of the later days and talk in more details about PCI Express specifically. Um, so the thing is, there is no open source cores for PCI Express which are optimized for high performance, uh, high performance real-time applications. Uh, there is uh, Zalibus, which, as I understand, is not really open source, but they provide you a source if you pay them. But it's very popular because it's very, very easy to do, but um, it's not giving you performance. Uh, if I remember correctly, the best it can do is maybe like 50% bus, uh, bus saturation. So uh, there is also Xilinx implementation, but if you're using Xilinx implementation with XGI bus, then you're really locked in with XGI bus with Xilinx, and uh, it's also not very efficient in terms of resources. And if you remember, we want to make this very, very inexpensive. So our goal is to, is to be able to fit everything in the smallest Arctic 7 FPGA. And that's quite challenging with all the stuff in there. And we just can't waste resources. So decision is to write your own uh, PCI Express implementation. That's how it looks like. We're not going to discuss it right now. <laughs> um, there were several iterations. Initially, it looked much simpler. Turned out not to work well. So, um, Some interesting stuff about PCI Express, uh, which we stumbled upon, is that uh, it was working really well on Atom, which is our main development platform because we are doing a lot of embedded stuff. Worked really well when we tried to uh, plug this into um, Core i7, just started hanging once in a while. So after like several you know, days, maybe, of yeah, <laughs> debugging, um, Sergey found that there's a very interesting statement in the standard which says that value zero in byte count actually stands not for zero bytes, but for 4,096 bytes. I mean, that's a really cool optimization. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another st thing is completion, which is a term in PCI Express basically for acknowledgement, uh, which also can carry some data back to your request. And um, sometimes if you're not sending completion, device just hangs. And what happens is that in this case, uh, due to some historical heritage of x86, um, it just starts returning you FFF. And if you have a register which says, is your device okay, and this register shows one to say the device is okay, guess what will happen? You will be always reading that your device is okay. So the suggestion is not to use one as a status uh, for OK and use either zero or better like a two-bit uh, sequence. So you definitely sure that you are OK and not getting FFFs. So um, when you have a device which again may, may fail at any of the layers, you just got this. Uh, new board, it's really hard, it's, it's really hard to debug, and uh, there's a lot of memory corruption. So we had a, a software bug, and it was writing DMA um, addresses incorrectly, and we were wondering why we are not getting any data in our buffers. At the same time, after several starts, operating system just crashes. Well, that's, um, that's the reason why, <laughs> why there is this UEFI protection which, uh, which prevents you from plugging in devices like this into your computer because it was basically writing data, like random data, into random portions of your memory. So a lot of debugging, 
um, a lot of uh, tests and test benches, mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to, uh, to find this. And um, another thing is if you deinitialize your driver incorrectly, and that's what's happening in, when you have plug and play device, which you can plug and unplug, then uh, you may end up in a situation uh, where you are trying to write into memory which is already freed by, uh, by approaching system and used for something else. Very well-known problem, but also happens here. So uh, there, why DME is really hard uh, is uh, because it has this uh, completion um, completion uh, architecture for writing, for, for, sorry, for, uh, for reading data. Writes are easy, you just send the data, you forget about it. It's a fire and forget system. But for reading, you really need to get your data back. And uh, the thing is, it looks like this. I really hope that there would be some pointing device. Uh, here, but basically on the top left uh, you can see requests for read, and on the right you can see uh, completion um, transactions. So basically, each transaction can be and most likely will be split into multiple transactions. So first of all, you have to collect all these pieces and uh, and uh, like write them into proper parts of the memory. But uh, that's not all. Uh, the thing is, the la latency between request and completion is really high. It's like 50 cycles. So if you have a single, uh, only single transaction in Fly, you will get really bad performance. You do need to have multiple transactions in Fly. And the worst thing is that uh, transactions can return data in a random order. So uh, it's a much com more complicated state machine uh, than we expected originally. So when I said you know, that our architecture was much simpler originally, we did not have all of this, and we had to uh, realize this while, uh, while implementing. So again, here was a whole description of how exactly this works, but not this time. Um, so now, after all these optimizations, we got 20 mega samples uh, per second, which is just six times lower than, than uh, what we are um, aiming at. So now, uh, the next thing is uh, PCI Express lane scalability. So uh, uh, PCI Express is uh, a serial bus, so it has multiple lanes, and they allow you to basically horizontally scale your bandwidth. One lane is uh, like X, then two lane is 2X, four lane is 4X, so the more lanes you have, um, the more uh, performance you are getting out of your, out of your bus. So the more bandwidth you get out of your bus, not performance, but. Um, so the issue is that a typical a mini PCI Express, uh, so the mini PCI Express standard only standardizes one lane, and second lane is left as optional, so uh, most motherboards don't support this. There are some, but not all of them. And uh, we really uh, wanted to get this done, so we designed a special uh, converter board, uh, which allows you to plug your mini PCI Express into a full-size PCI Express and get um, two, uh, two lanes uh, working. And we're also planning to have a, a similar board, which will have uh, multiple slots, so you will be able to uh, get multiple uh, Xtrix SDRs onto the same, uh, onto the same uh, carrier board and plug this into, let's say, PCI Express 16X. And you will get like really a lot of um, is there a really a lot of IQ data, which then will be your problem how to how to process. Um, so with uh, two axes, it's about twice uh, performance. So we are getting 50 um, mega samples per second, and uh, that's the time to really uh, cut the fat because uh, the real uh, uh, sample size of LMS7 is 12 bits. 
And we are transmitting 16 because it's easier, because a CPU is working on um, 8, 16, 32. So um, we originally designed the driver to support 8-bit, 12-bit, and 16-bit uh, to be able to do this scaling. And um, for, um, for the test, we said, OK, let's go from 16 to 8-bit. Uh, we'll lose some dynamic range, but who cares uh, these days. Um, still stayed, stayed the same. It's still 50 mega samples per second, no matter what we did. Um, and um, that was a lot of um, interesting uh, debugging going on. And we realized that uh, we actually uh, made the, another, um, not that I really mistake, we didn't, uh, we didn't really know this when we designed, but um, we should have used a higher voltage for this high-speed bus to get it to the full performance. And at 1.8, it was just degrading too fast, and the bus itself was not performing well. So our next prototype will be uh, using higher, um, uh, higher, higher voltage for, specifically for this bus. And this is kind of stuff which makes uh, designing hardware for high speed really hard because you have to care about the coherence of the parallel buses on your uh, on your system. So uh, at the same time, we do want to keep 1.8 volt for everything else as much as possible because another problem we are facing with this device is that uh, by the standard Mini PCI Express allows only like. 2.5 watt? watts uh, of uh, power consumption, no more. And that's your, we were very lucky that LMS7 has like, so, good, um, uh, so good power consumption performance. We actually had some extra space to have FPGA and GPS and all this stuff, but we just can't um, let the power consumption go up. Our uh, measurements on this device showed about like 2, 2.3 2. 2. 2. 3 2. 3. watts of power consumption, so we are like at, at the limit at this point. So uh, when we fix the bus with a higher voltage, again, now it's a theoretical exercise because we haven't done this yet. It's planned to, to happen in a couple of months. Uh, we should be able uh, to get to this number, which is just 1.2 uh, times uh, slower. And then uh, the next thing will be to fix another issue which we made at the very beginning. We procured a wrong chip. So <laughs> just one digit difference. Uh, you can see it's selected in, uh, highlighted in, in red and green. Uh, and this chip uh, it supports only a generation one PCI Express, which is twice slower than uh, generation two PCI Express. So again, hopefully we'll replace the chip and just uh, get very simple doubling of the performance. Um, still, it will be uh, slower than we uh, wanted it to be. Uh, and here is what kind of like practical versus theoretical numbers. Um, well, as every bus, it has, uh, it has overheads. And uh, one of the things which, again, we realized uh, when we were implementing this is that even though the standard standardized is a payload size of four kilobytes, uh, actual implementations are different. For example, uh, the desktop computers like Core, uh, Core, Intel Core, or Intel Atom, uh, they only have 128 byte payload. So there is much more overhead uh, going on the bus uh, to um, to transfer uh, to transfer data. And even theoretically, you can only achieve 87 uh, perfor uh, 87 percent efficiency. And uh, on Xeon, we tested and we found that they're using 256 payload size. Uh, and this can give you like a 92% efficiency on the bus. And this is before the overhead. So the real, uh, the real reality is, is, even, uh, is even worse. An interesting thing, which we also did not expect, uh, is that uh, we originally were, were developing on uh, Intel Atom. 
And the other thing was working great. Um, when we plug this into a laptop, like Core i7, multi-core, really powerful device, we didn't expect that it wouldn't work. Obviously, like Core i7 should work better than Atom. No, <laughs> not always. Uh, the thing is, uh, we were plugging into a laptop which uh, had a built-in video card, which was sitting on the same PCI bus, and uh, probably um, manufacture uh, hard-coded, higher, um, what's called, um, higher, um, I forgot the word, priority. Priority, yes. A higher priority for the video card than for everything else in the system because you don't want your, uh, your screen to flicker. And so when you move a window, you actually see their late packets, late packets coming to your PCI device. We had to introduce a jitter buffer and add more, uh, add more uh, FIFO uh, into, uh, into the device to, to smooth it out. And on the other hand, Xeon is performing really well. So it's very optimized. That said, we, we tested it with, uh, with discrete uh, card and outperforms everything by a whooping 5-7%. It's what you get for, for the price. So um, this is actually uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, so uh, we still have not scheduled any workshop, but if there if there is any interest in uh, uh, actually seeing uh, the device um, working, uh, or if you are uh, interested in uh, learning more about the PCI Express in details, let us know. We'll we'll schedule something in the next uh, few days. Um, that's it, and I think we can. Uh, Proceed with questions if there are any. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, if you are leaving now, please try to leave quietly because we might have some questions and we want to hear them. And if you have questions, please line up right behind the microphones. And I think we'll just wait because we don't have anything from the signal angel. Uh, however, if you're watching on stream, um, you can hop into the channels and over social media to ask questions, and they will be answered, hopefully. So, um, that microphone. Yeah. Um, tell me. Um, what's uh, the minimum and maximum frequency of the card? Uh, you mean uh, RF frequency? And now, now the, the, the minimum frequency you can sample at. The most STR, STR, RTL STR devices can only uh, sample at over 50 megahertz. Is there a similar limitation at your card? Yeah, so if you're talking about a ref frequency, it can go uh, from uh, like almost zero, uh, even though that works worse below 50 megahertz, and all the way to 3.0. Uh, Eight gigahertz, yeah. if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, and in terms of the sample rate, uh, right now it works from like about two mega samples two per mega second, samples. Oh, and 50. old to about fifty right now. But again, we're planning to get it to this number as we quoted. Okay, the microphone over there. Thanks for your talk. Uh, did you manage to put your Linux kernel driver to the main line? Oh, not yet. I mean, it's not it's even it's uh, not, <laughs> not even like fully published. So uh, I did not uh, say in the beginning. Sorry for this. Uh, that the, we only uh, just manufactured the first prototype, which we debugged heavily. So we are only planning to manufacture the second prototype with with all these fixes, and then we will release uh, like the the kernel driver and other thing. And we are, I'm not sure we will maybe we will try or maybe won't try. Haven't decided yet. Thanks. Okay, and but over that here will be again? the whole other experience. Okay, over there. Hey, looks like uh, you went through some incredible amounts of pain to make this work. So I was wondering, um, aren't there any simulators, at least for parts of the system, for the PCIe bus, for the DMA, something? Any simulators so that you can actually uh, first design the system there and uh, debug it more easily, you know? Yeah, there are available simulators, but the problem so. <laughs> They are non-free, so you have to pay for them. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> and we choose the hard way. 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, we have a question from the Signal Angel. Yeah, um, are the FPGA code, Linux driver, and library code, and the design project files public? And if so, did they post them yet? Are you, did we have posted them yet? They can, can't find them on xtirx.io. Yeah, so they're not uh, published yet. As I said, we, we haven't released them. Um, so uh, the, the drivers and libraries will definitely be available. FPGA code, uh, we are considering this probably also will be available uh, in open source. but. We will publish them together with uh, uh, with the public announcement of the of the device. Okay, that microphone. Uh, yes. Uh, did you guys see any signal integrity issues between the, on the PCI bus or on this bus to the LMS chip, the Lime Micro chip? I think that's doing the RF. Right. Uh, did you try to measure uh, signal integrity issues, or uh, because well, there were some reliability issues, right? Yeah, we actually so PCI with PCI we never had issues if I remember correctly. No. Uh, I just it was just working. Actually, with... the board is so small, mm -hmm. and uh, when uh, there is small traces, there is no problem in signal integrity. So it actually save us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, designing a small board is easier. Yeah, with the LMS seven, uh, the problem is not the like signal integrity in terms of difference in the in the length of the of the traces, but rather the fact that uh, the signal de the signal uh, um, degrades over 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 voltage oh, sorry, over speed uh, in terms of voltage and it drops below the detection level and like all this stuff. We did some measurements. I, I actually wanted to add some pictures here, but decided it's uh, not go not going to be super interesting. Okay, microphone over there. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, how much work would it be to convert the 2x2 two two SDR into an 8-input logic analyzer in terms of hard and software? So Definitely. to have a really fast logic analyzer where you can record uh, unlimited traces with... Logic analyzer. So ba basically it's just also a, a digital, to, uh, an analog digital converter. And um, you largely want fast sampling and a large amount of memory to store the traces. Well, I just think it's like not the best use for it. Um, it's probably <laughs> I think I I I don't know. Um, maybe Sergey has any ideas, but um, yeah. I think it's just maybe easier to get uh, a high-speed ADC and uh, replace the Lime chip with a high-speed ADC to get. Uh, to get what you want, because uh, our, uh, the Lime chip has like so many things there specifically for RF. Yeah, the, the main problem you cannot just sample original data. You should uh, uh, shift it over frequency, so you cannot mm -hmm. sample original signal. And they're using it for like something else except spectrum analyzing is uh, hard. Okay, another question from the internet. Yes, uh, have you compared the sample rate of the ADC of the Lime's DR chip to the USRP ADCs? And if so, how does the lower sample rate affect the performance? So, um, comparing low sample rate to high sample rate, we have not done many testing of, uh, we haven't done much testing on the RF performance yet because we were so busy with all this stuff. So uh, we are yet to see in terms of um, low um, bit rates uh, versus sample rate versus high sample rate. Well, high sample rate always gives you um, better performance, but you also uh, get higher power consumption. So I guess it's uh, the question of uh, what's more, more, more important for you. OK, over there. I've gathered there is no uh, mixer bypass, so you can't directly sample the signal. Is no. there a way to use the same antenna for send and receive uh, yet? Or, um... well, actually, there is uh, input for ADC. But the, it's not a bypass, it's a dedicated uh, yeah. pin on a LMS chip. And since we are very space constrained, we didn't erode them. So you cannot uh, actually bypass it. 
Okay, yeah, in, in, in this, in our specific hardware. So in general, so in, uh, in the LMS chip, there is a special, again, like, uh, to rephrase, a special pin, which allows you to drive your signal directly to ADC without all the mixers, filters, all this radio stuff, just directly to ADC. So yes, theoretically, that's possible. We even uh, thought about this, but uh, it doesn't fit this design. Okay, <laughs> and can I share antennas? Because I have an existing laptop with existing antennas, so... Uh, but I would use the same antenna for send and receive. Yeah, so I mean, that's uh, depends on like what exactly do you want to do. If you want a TDD system, then yes. If you want an FDD system, then you will have to put a small uh, duplexer in there. But yeah, that's the idea. So you can plug this into your laptop and uh, use your existing uh, antennas. That's one of the one of the uh, ideas of how to use uh, Xtrix. Yeah, because there's all four connectors. Yeah, and one thing which I actually forgot to mention, is, like I kind of mentioned in the slides, is that um, any other SDRs which are based on uh, Ethernet or on the USB can't work with a, a CSMA uh, wireless systems. And the most famous CSMA system is Wi-Fi. So it uh, turns out that because of the latency between your operating system and your radio uh, on, um, on USB, uh, you just can't react fast enough for Wi-Fi to work because you, probably you know that in Wi-Fi you carry your sense and if you sense that the spectrum is free, you start transmitting. Doesn't make a sense uh, when you have huge <coughs> latency because you all know that you know the spectrum was free back then. So with uh, with Xtrix, you actually can uh, work with CSMA systems like Wi-Fi. So again, it, it makes it possible to have a fully software implementation of Wi-Fi in your laptop. It obviously won't work like as like good as your commercial Wi-Fi, because you will have to do a lot of processing on your CPU, but for some uh, purposes, like experimentation, for example, for wireless labs and R&D labs, that's really valuable. Thanks. Okay, over there. Mm. Okay, um, what uh, PCB de design package did you use? Altium. Okay. Altium, yeah. Um, and I'd be interested in the PCI Express workshop. Would be really great if you do this one. Sorry, second. Uh, it would be really great if you do the PCI Express workshop. Mm. Ah, PCI Thank Express you. workshop. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have one more question from the microphones, mm -hmm. and that's you. Okay, great talk, and again, I would appreciate the PCI workshop if it ever happens. Um, what are the synchronization options between multiple cards? Mm. Can you mm -hmm. synchronize the ADC yeah. clock, yeah. and can you synchronize the presumably digitally created IF. Yes, so. So unfortunately, just uh, IF, IF synchronization is not possible because Lime chip doesn't expose a low frequency, but we can synchronize uh, digitally. So we have special one PPS signal synchronization, we have lines for clock synchronization, and uh, 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 other stuff we can do in software. So the Lime chip has phase correction register. So when you measure uh, phase, phase, uh, difference. phase difference, so you can compensate it on different boards. So tune to a station a long way away and then rotate the phase until it aligns. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little, little tricky, but possible. So that's one of our plans for future because we do want to see like 128 by 128 MIMO at home. <laughs> okay, we have another question from the internet. No, I actually have two, quest two questions. The first one is, uh, what is the expected price uh, after a prototype stage? And the second one is, uh, can you tell us more about this setup uh, you had for debugging the PCIe issues? Uh, so could you repeat the second question? It's uh, set up uh, the bug. More think. about the setup you had for debugging the PCIe issues. Second question, I think it's uh, most about our next workshop because it's uh, yeah. a more complicated setup, so we mostly remove everything about it in our current presentation. Yeah, but in general, I mean, in terms of hardware setup, that was our hardware setup, so 
we bought this uh, PCI Express to uh, Thunderbolt 3. Um, we uh, bought uh, a laptop which supports Thunderbolt 3, and that's how we were debugging it. So we don't need like a full-fledged PC. We don't have to re restart it all the time. Uh, so in terms of price, uh, we don't have that there uh, like fixed price yet. So what I, all I can say right now is that we are uh, targeting um, no more than uh, your um, like BladeRF or HackRF devices, and uh, probably even cheaper for for some versions. Okay, we are out of time. So thank you again, Sergey and um, Alexander. <laughs>